Good morning. Uh, thanks for being here. And I'd uh, like to thank the Games Committee for inviting me and the university for hosting me here. It's been a great uh, conference yesterday on elite sport. And now we turn to one of the areas I'm most passionate about, kids in sport. And what I like is, and we heard yesterday in a talk from Norway, they're not like distinct. They all kind of come together. The little ones become the big ones, the big ones model to the little ones, and you know, an integrated system works the best. Um, what I'm gonna talk about today is life skills, and I'll define that as, as we go forward in a few minutes. And, but just a, a second to kind of think, why would we wanna develop these life skills uh, in sport? If we go back to, you know, most everything starts with the Greeks or some Vikings somewhere. Um, but the moral value of, Plato said, the moral value of sports and exercise far outweigh the physical value. So, you know, the philosophers thinking about there's maybe more to this sport than just the physical side, which is pretty cool in and of itself. If we kind of come up in time in number, a, a, a lot of years, we can, the founder of the modern Olympic Games, Pierre de Goubertin, uh, the Frenchman for each individual sport is a possible source of inner improvement. And then he goes on to Olympism, uh, seeks to create a way of life based on the joy of, uh, you know, found in effort, the educational value of a good example, and respect for universal ethical principles. If you know much about the history of the Olympic Games, back in like 1910 to 1920, he actually held a couple conferences that's focused on sports psychology. Um, so, you know, he's pretty innovative in that thinking. And the downside, he was against women in the game, so obviously he wasn't a perfect guy uh, for us. Uh, but I think he had some interesting ideas in this topic. Um, kind of, I did some work in D Detroit, Michigan, which is one of our, our, in our state, one of our larger cities a number of years ago, and I just pulled these statistics from that time. It's a, a very impoverished area, much of Detroit, some areas, and at the time, 40% of the youth would not graduate from high school, which, you know, was very concerning. Um, and 35% of those who didn't graduate from high school will end up being in jail by the age of 35. So a lot of people view, how do we give these kids a sense of purpose? How do we give kids through sport, which they tend to like, how do we use sport not only for physical health and um, the beauty of sport itself, but how do we maybe teach them some other lessons along the way? Um, and if you're interested in top sport, this is a little dated, but this is Michael Vick, who is a famous American football player who got a big NFL professional contract and then blew it all because he got involved in dog fighting and his whole career got derailed and you never heard from him again. So here's somebody, and we, we see that in the professional footballers. You know, they're off to a great start, and then all of a sudden, because they didn't have these life skills, they were great on the pitch, but off the pitch they were a disaster, and they derailed their career. So, so I think this relates to everybody in sport in one way or another. Now, life skills, I, I've kind of referred to it, but I haven't really defined it. We kind of think of them as those mental, emotional, so social attributes, characteristics, and behaviors that athletes develop or refine from sports participation and have the potential, and I'll talk more about that, to transfer beyond sport. So sometimes we learn these skills because they really help us in sport. I learn how to set goals, I get better at swimming or uh, athletics or whatever the sport is, but other times do I apply that to the rest of my life. And the second kind of blue box here are examples of life skills. The ability to set and achieve goals, confidence, leadership, discipline, and it's a, a, a kind of a long list that people could potentially learn or develop through sport and ap apply elsewhere in their life. There's a number of other aliases out there that you'll see some of the literature, if you read some of the scientific literature, would talk about psychosocial attributes a big one, uh, we just had the minister t from education, you'll read a lot about social emotional skills. And actually that hasn't been linked enough to life skills, but there's a lot of similarities. And that's really big in like uh, education. Um, the, and th that is the process through which children enhance their ability to integrate thinking, feeling, and behaving to achieve important life tasks. And it's emphasized a lot in, in schools, especially impoverished area, because if the kids have behavioral issues, you can't teach them the content that we'd like to teach them. 
And down at the bottom, you can see some of the components. Uh, the ability to recognize and manage their emotions, establish healthy relationships, set positive goals, meet personal and social needs, and make responsible and ethical decisions. Now, there's been major reviews of scientists have done major reviews of this literature over the years. And the typical conclusion, I picked it from a British uh, source, Emmy and her colleagues, when they looked at all the literature, they found that 40 psychosocial outcomes or life type skills were associated with youth sport participation. So kids who participate in sport tended to be a, have a number of skills associated or, or attributes. There were some negative findings, stress and burnout in particular, but overall, it's probably more positive than negative as, as what they concluded. So that's good news for us. You know, being involved in the sport world, it's probably, you know, most people think it's good for kids. We know there's some downsides at times, but overall, it's probably pretty good for the kids. So, but I just, uh, you know, not a workshop per se, but I just want you to take 30 seconds or maybe a minute. I want you to reflect on your own life if you were an athlete. So I know we have a bunch of handball players, uh, basketball player, athletics. What life skills do you think you learned from being in sport for the number of years you were in? You know, what, what, what did you pick up? Do you think you developed any attributes from playing? Chris was a tennis player. Did he pick anything up from being a tennis player? Okay, so just take a second and think about that. What, what do you think you developed? Anybody willing to share one? You can just shout it out, hopefully in English, so I know what it is, but. Discipline. Discipline, okay. What's that? Yeah, work at teamwork we hear, discipline. Any others? Time management. Okay, so this, this is, we probably, you can see why you get to 40, because <laughs> people get different things from sport, learning how to work with different people, you know, we could break teamwork down, the ability to communicate, leadership, you hear these kind of things. Learning from mistakes. Learning from mistakes. Okay, good. Yeah, so now the life skill transfer piece is different, because there's a lot of attributes or characteristics or skills we could pick up from being in sport, like a number of the ones you just mentioned. And I use that, that helps me on my team in sport. But does that help me off the football pitch? Do I apply that if I have a job in, in some setting or I'm going to school? And that's where life skills come going in, kind of a complicated definition. The ongoing process by which an individual further develops or learns and internalizes personal assets or psychosocial skills in sport. And then experiences some kind of change in application of those in a life domain beyond sport. So let's just take something simple like I learned to be disciplined in sport. Am I disciplined in my, some other area of my life? Okay, so I'm very disciplined in sport, but I never clean my room at home if I'm a kid. <laughs> or I learned to set goals. We see this in the US because our, remember our sport's embedded in our schools. Somebody's a really good athlete, highly achievement oriented, goal oriented, and yet they're flunking all their cl academic classes. So that goal setting didn't get applied over. So that's the transfer piece. And, and I've been thinking more about this, and I, I kind of think we have instrumental psychological skills. As a sports psych person or a coach, I'm having my team learn skills to help them perform better. Emotional control. So we can handle the tough situation or communication or leadership. I'm doing that so we win more games. I'm doing that so we run faster. Uh, whatever it might be, <laughs> execute skills in gymnastics. So I call those sort of instrumental skills. But for an instrumental skills to be a life skills, I've got to take it out of the sport context to somewhere else. Okay, And that doesn't always happen. So uh, a way to kind of visually depict this, the circle on uh, your left, I, I just put fictitiously some skills somebody re might report that they picked up in sport. A goal setting, confidence, leadership, discipline, emotional control, teamwork. And on the right, I have one in a life area. 
Maybe only confidence transferred or discipline transferred or teamwork, but not all of them automatically transfer. Now, one of the first implications here for us as coaches, people in sport kind of automatically assume these things transfer. And they don't necessarily transfer as much as we'd like to think they would. Now, some, some do, but I think this assumption that automatically a young person is going to take what you taught them and apply it somewhere else may not be as automatic as we think. So how are life skills developed through sport? If we kind of step back a minute, how are kids picking these up? Well, one we forget about is family socialization. We just did some studies. And in a lot of, a lot of the skills, you know, coaches sometimes assume the kids come to sport and somehow I'm teaching them all these new things. But if their parents emphasize discipline at home, then I'm probably reinforcing it. Or your parents emphasize working well with others. Well, then you come to sport and you meet a lot of different others, some who you don't like, but you have to learn how to work well with them. So we kind of uh, uh, embellish these or further advance them. Other times we teach something totally different that a kid doesn't come in with. But family socialization is a big one. Trial and error. Most of us learned something about mental preparation because when we were a kid, we maybe got, we didn't focus enough and we performed poorly or we got uptight or whatever. And over time, you sort of figured it out or hopefully figured it out better as time passed on. So trial and error. Modeling others. Uh, we had a presentation yesterday. I know some of you weren't here. But um, a, a, a soccer coach talked about the uh, older players on the team, the club, bring in and they have a big influence on the younger players. So the younger players see how the older player acts and treats. Sometimes, and this is appropriate for a lot of us that are coaches, we want to teach these things. My team's a wreck. I, I got to teach emotional control. They don't deal well with adversity. So I'm going to teach it directly. Other times there's curriculums and programs to do this, like I was in Singapore, and it's a big emphasis in all their elementary schools to teach sort of these social emotional life skills. And there's a part we don't talk very much. Uh, there's a genetic piece, maybe 50 to 52% of our personality, I've read statistics like that, is determined by genetics. Okay, not just sports, so there might be something to that as we go forward. On the right side of this slide, I have like, how are these learned? There's some implicitly, and that is you participate on my athletics team. I don't really talk much about these life skills, but you pick them up. You pick some up from just, from your peers, from being on the team, sort of on your own. And then there's the explicit. I'm the coach and I decide we're gonna focus on emotional control, leadership, and communication this year. And I in, do intentional things for the kids to sort of get those across the season, right? Now, there's some support for both approaches. You're gonna pick some things up just from being in sport, good or bad, probably hopefully more good. Most experts feel that, uh, and Chris Harwood will talk about that today, if we're more explicit or intentional, you know, why do we have schools? Well, kids probably could learn a lot via trial and error but we have teachers in schools because we think we can explicitly teach them things. And the sport world's the same. You know, that's why we have coaches. Now, why do these instrumental psychological skills develop in sport not always transfer? One, the athlete doesn't develop the skill. I, I played on some teams. I don't think I learned very much in terms of these skills. I had a crappy coach. It was sort of disorganized, et cetera. The athletes develops the instrumental psychological skills but doesn't recognize that it can be transferred beyond sport. Actually, some people who work in elite sport, the elite athlete sort of finishes his or her soccer career and they sometimes panic a little because they never thought about life after. And some of the people who work with them talk about, well, what skills did you learn in soccer? <laughs> well, I learned some leadership, some communication, emotional control. And how might that pursue if you pursue a business career? And they help them kind of think about those things. Um, the athlete's not motivated to transfer. The example I gave in our country, we have some really good college athletes that have great psychological skills. They're great athletes, 
and they're flunking out of school because they don't apply any of it to their academics. They're not interested. The last is the transfer context is not conducive to the use of the skill. I do a lot of youth leadership research. It's really interesting, the youth leadership, one of the biggest constraints of why it doesn't work is one, adults don't give kids real decision making. So the adult's so controlling, we don't want it to be screwed up so we step in. Or I teach a kid how to lead on my team, but then they go to another team or another contact and the adult doesn't let them lead. You know, hey, shut up and just listen, type thing. So I think that's a really important one. Sometimes the context isn't gonna allow the person to develop. All right, so of the life skills you thought about, you developed in that first little reflective piece I did in, in sport, or psychosocial attributes, or instrumental, however we wanna call them, skills. So we had people mention some. How many of those do you think you've transferred to life beyond sport? to use in other settings? Half. About half, okay. Okay, it's a real hard thing to do because it's sort of like, oh, I don't know if I did, you know. I, I realize, but, if, but I think the whole idea that, okay, I learned that, but did I really apply it somewhere else? That I really, was I really able to use that sort of skill as we go forward? All right, and that's what I kind of want you to think about today when you're working with children I'll jump to some steps at the end here that you can follow, but the first one is, what do I want to teach the kids? What are my priorities? Where are they at? And then secondly, am I working with the kids to think about how they might use that beyond the sports setting? Now there's some challenges to doing all this. It sounds pretty straightforward. We have a, a sports sociologist that said this about 10 years ago, the great sport evangelist myth so an evangelist is, uh, goes out and tries to convert everybody to their religion. And he says, a lot of times in sport we've bought into, if you're in sport, you're gonna develop into a good person no matter what. You're gonna catch it, you're gonna be there, and coaches believe I don't need to do anything. And you know, I was a wrestler, so anybody who wrestles is a really good, hardworking person. I was in athletics and I make, I'm a tennis player. I actually find it quite humorous. I work with a lot of sports because I, I love sport. But the tennis people think their sport is the best one in the world in developing everything. And then I go talk to the soccer footballers and they think their sport is. And of course we know here handball is, because my hosts are handball players. You know, so everybody thinks their sport does this somehow automatically. Well, I don't know about you, but I learned some really, I learned how to cheat in sport. Hopefully I didn't use it a lot. I learned you know, some things maybe that weren't so good, right? Some coaches don't make life skills a priority. They don't care about this. I'm just trying to win games. I'm just trying to get the job done. Some athletes are so focused on performance, they're not interested. You know, they're like, hey, I don't really want this. Um, we did a study with a summer camp that was, we had data to show these kids in wrestling really developed a lot of these skills. But one boy we interviewed, you know, at the, at the end goes, I wasn't interested in any of that crap. I was here to learn how to take people down and turn them over. Quite interesting, six months after, we interviewed him again, he goes, I'm gonna go back next year because I probably should have paid attention to that stuff. <laughs> so it wasn't like you know, he did it and the camp really focused on this. Some athletes are not aware that they developed a skill to be transferred. I, I learned some things but I never really thought about it. And coaches and other adults don't know how to develop the skills. You know, like, um, you know, a classic one for years, my coaches would tell me how to relax, would tell me to relax. And I'm going, well, I would do it if I knew how, but they never told me what to do to relax, you know, type, type of thing. So sometimes I think as coaches, well, just relax out there. Well, I would have if I knew how. <laughs> you didn't tell me, you know, how to do a fadeaway jump shot. You taught me how to do it. Now, a few other major findings, and I'll get to some practical steps and implications. We just did a study here um, where we interviewed, actually, people my age who played sport, high school sport like 50 years ago. And I thought it'd be interesting to see what they learned in high school. Did any of it stick with them over time? And one of the biggest findings that I want everybody to take from here, if you're a coach, 
99% of what the kids hear from you is going to be gone if they'll just forget it or didn't sink in. But in this study, we found people 50 years later would vividly remember what coaches did on one day and told them something in some experience. Now, the problem if we're a coach, it's hard to know the 99% they're not going to stick from the 1% that sticks. And when we actually interviewed the coaches of these people, the coaches didn't remember some of these life-changing experiences the athlete did. So the athlete said, yeah, the other day my coach talked to me about this and did this, and I can remember how that changed me. And I said, I asked a coach about it. No, I don't remember that at all. <laughs> so I think the, a, a big implication for youth coaches is you're on 24-7. Everything you say or do has the potential to affect somebody in a big way. And the hard part as a coach is I can't tell the 99% from the 1% that's really going to stick long term. But I think that's a really important thing to, for us to think about. Not enough attention, the second point I have here is paid to the psychosocial development of what the kids bring, in, in this case, in our case, the scholastic thing. A lot of times we aren't developing these skills, we're amplifying what they come in with. Especially if the kids come from um, good intact families, we're reinforcing it. Now a really interesting one is if kids come from a really troubled home where they don't have good role models, others, then it's maybe a little different story, but sometimes we're really amplifying and growing these skills. Probably one of the biggest findings in this area is positive coach-athlete relationship amplifies all the good effects. The better the, co the kids and the coach connect, the bigger effects you get. Although in some of our recent studies, we find kids learn from inappropriate coaching now, obviously, we don't want to go get inappropriate coaches so they get good learning experiences. But when we interview people, they say, yeah, that coach was a jerk. That coach yelled at us all the time. You know, we meet coaches who said, that's why I got into coaching. I didn't want to be that coach. We had a elite coach yesterday say, I got into coaching so I could be the coach I wish I had. <laughs> you know, so, um, so sometimes... It, Less than optimal experiences might be learning experiences. One of the things we've learned is how we help kids interpret those experiences, adversity, failure, those type of things. And some powerful lessons can be learned from young athletes who remain on teams but don't get to play much. And actually, this is really important because in the United States now, we're finding kids don't want to stay on a team if they're not getting a lot of playing time. And they kind of switch teams and they're kind of doing all this. And it, Believe me, because I, I, I look at my own, I played multiple sports growing up, and I look at the sport I learned the most from was the sport I played the least. I sat on the bench with a coach a lot and talked with a coach. It was a great coach. Believe me, I wish I was playing back then. But I probably, when I look back now, I learned more from that coach not playing than I did in the sports I was captain and playing from. So, you know, in my case, it was, you know, in fairness to people. I was captain in two sports, and I was a starter, and I was a good athlete. And this sport, I was lucky to make the team, but I liked the sport. So it was kind of a good experience for me to sit the bench or know what it was like to be a role player, those type of things. Young, kid, young people will differ a lot in their openness to how the, learning these skills. And their ability to reflect on them seems to be really important. One study we did with the this wrestling coach who, who ran these intensive camps for high school boys. And I mean, this was like US Army Ranger training meets positive youth development. It's kind of a weird combination. They go to this month long camp in the summer, it's overnight, and they train like harder than anything. But he's teaching them these lessons all the time. And one of the things he did is that night they had a book and they had to go reflect on what they learned that day. Now, you want to talk about an explicit coach. This coach would get up and you'd go to the bathroom in the morning, shut the door of the stall, and there'd be the thought for the day. We're talking about discipline today. And then you'd go to other areas, he'd be talking about discipline. He'd have a talk about discipline. Then he'd, as you were doing things during the day, he'd talk about discipline again. And then at night, and that might go for the whole week, and then at night, you're reflecting in your book about what discipline means. Okay, re really interesting, explicit approach to teaching this. Um, 
And I, this individual, too, I think was really uh, important. He was a former U.S. Army Ranger. He said, you don't learn these life skills from lectures. You learn them from experience. So he'd try to put the kids and experiences in the camp, like bring them to failure. And, and, and he's overall pretty positive, but bring them to failure so they know what failure is, and then learn how to deal with failure. Um, and the final point I have on this one is, how do we consider the agency? We know kids probably learn more when they feel like they're the origin of their behavior versus a pawn. How do we give, give kids agency and voice? You hear a lot about that in voice today. Now, uh, before I move into our implications in a minute or two here, um, they did the National Research Council in the US about 20 years ago, looked at programs in the arts, programs in sport, all sorts of youth development programs, and these were the characteristics that they found in the programs that were effective. Kids are psychologically and physically safe, okay, which is a huge issue in sport today. We know there's predators, et cetera, but how do we make sure they're psychologically safe? And the, uh, um, it's terrible. The sexual abuse stuff is obviously beyond comprehension that it happens, but it's physical, so you can tell, but emotional abuse of kids is harder because it might be through words or sort of actions. Consistent and clear structure. There's structure and some adult supervision. There's supportive relationships, opportunities to belong, positive social norms. Some of the clubs I've, in Denmark in sailing, I remember reading some studies from a colleague there that were really effective. The clubs has norms from the senior team all the way down. And the senior players feel an obligation to kind of support the younger players. And those seem to be the more effective clubs. Interesting, they seem to be the more successful on the field, but they're probably teaching these values. There's skill opportunities, there's efficacy of mattering, and obviously the more this can be integrated with the family, the school, other type of things, everybody's on the same page, the more likely you get consistent results. I'm gonna skip a couple things here because of time. Many life skills are fostered from experience, adversity, and failure. And obviously, that's not a lot of fun. But one thing is, sport's a natural laboratory for failure and adversity. And we can really, and kids care about sport, so we can really help kids learn about how to deal with adversity and failure. Um, there was one tennis coach, I just reviewed an article that did this, that he wanted people to kind of stay task focused, think about self-improvement. Well, he had every practice up on the fence, you know, around the courts, he had some key words that he talked about. He'd send kids texts to talk about, you know, focus on the challenge and improvement and winning means this. But he consistently did that across the year. And that's probably why the program worked. Um, and the last, the second point I already talked about. Let me finish here with some steps for you to think about, see if they'd work in your programs, if you want to teach some of these life skills through sport. The first one is, it sounds dumb, but to assess where the kids are at. We make assumptions. What life skills are my kids bringing into sport? Now, that's, that's pretty, a little harder to do. Sometimes we talk about, we don't do projects at our institute without first doing a needs assessment. What do we think the kids need? <laughs> what kind of problems are you having? Those type of things. What are their strengths? All right? What, if you can, what life skills do the families in the club sort of emphasize? Love, some of you are in clubs from the time you are a kid <laughs> till now, so you have a pretty good, like, what's the makeup of our club? Is the makeup changing? You know, are there, in different countries, immigrant families coming in? Is that different? What have they learned from previous sport experiences? One thing I do is it's, it's more instrumental psych skills, but I'll ask the kids, like, what do you think you need to be the best athlete in your sport? You know, top athlete in Iceland. Well, I need to be motivated. I need to be disciplined. We'll, we'll kind of list those out. And then I'll have them grade themselves, like from 1 to 10 on each of those. Well, that gives me where they think they're at. And then I can look whether they're reasonable, that type of thing. What lessons have they learned from other things? So trying to get an idea where they're at to start with. 
then we are trying to, and again, some of this has to be nuanced and subtle, how open are they to further developing these life skills? Uh, I remember interviewing one coach and he said this, and this athlete was really smart, and the athlete told us, I wasn't learning, I was, wasn't interested in any of that stuff. And the coach said, yeah, I didn't talk to him too much about that because he wasn't too interested. And what was interesting, this person was like the smartest kid in the school, went on as an engineer, and when we interviewed him throughout his life, he had problems socially connecting with other people. <laughs> and he didn't get job, uh, uh, perform, uh, ra not raises, but new positions, et cetera. And I, I was kind of thinking about this. I go, well, it kind of makes sense. He wasn't interested in this social development stuff. And for his whole life, it sort of plagued him in his career. All right, but he's got to be open. I already mentioned reflective ability, and sometimes we're reinforcing family values. Okay, so that's sort of where are we at at the front end. How do I create a could, uh, you know, and I guess one other thing I'd put there is we interviewed coaches who were got, given national awards for change. They were nominated by players for changing their life. And what was interesting, when we interviewed the coaches, we go, what, what are your goals for your teams? Time management, discipline, and communication. And the next one would be different. Uh, it would be, you know, like um, emotional control, playing as a team, et cetera. But what was really interesting, I do this as a test as a coach. I'll ask them what, their, what like, attributes they want their kids to develop. And then, uh, then after they tell me, I go, what did you do last week to develop those? And the really good ones will go, well, we did this, <laughs> or we did this. They give me a specific example versus the evangelist myth, like, well, you caught it last week because I did it. So I think they can give you pretty explicit strategies of what they've done. Now, some of that, uh, I think Chris may talk about that this afternoon. We know if there's a task-oriented self-improvement environment versus sort of dog-eat-dog, dog, that's going to contribute to this. Uh, Fry Walling has done some great work about caring climates. Simple things like a coach uses every kid's name at least once in practice in a meaningful way every day. So everybody gets recognized, you know, not like a formulaic, but just naturally but they make sure every kid gets recognized. That creates a much more caring climate for the kids to feel connected. And some research on peer support. Um, one thing for older kids now, I recommend we have one of the jobs of the captain is to monitor the social media. The coach is the last one to know what's going on in social media. <laughs> but the captain, and you might tell the whole team, the captain's job is to monitor the social media and tell you to take down post, or I told them to tell me if there's something that's not appropriate. I already mentioned using the intentional strategies. Life skills are taught more than they're caught. This, for those of you that are more in administrative roles, are we picking coaches with the right philosophy? A gentleman named Dan Varner, I was doing work in Detroit, really, really impressive guy. We did a coaching clinic for him, a pilot we developed, which was going to emphasize some of these life skill things. And the, the, the participants came, they were volunteer coaches, and he said, I'd like to thank you for coming today. Because we really care about kids in Detroit, and we're trying to have a sense of purpose for these kids, et cetera. Now, if you're interested in loading up your team with the best players, and if you're interested in going undefeated this year, I get that, and that's great. But you're at the wrong place. I'll find you another club that, that does that. This club, our number one priority is to help kids develop a sense of purpose through sport. So I was so impressed because, I mean, he, they, they had a hustle to get coaches. And the first thing he's saying, I got to get the right people on the bus. <laughs> Are we going to do that? Um, you know, a, a, another example, I was doing some international work, Olan Koss, Right to Play. I talked to him, and we were doing some work in Africa in the time, and they said the worst thing to do is to go in with money in Africa and say you're starting a program. What you want to do is go in six months early and go into the community and start a program with no money and see who gets involved, then go in with the money, because then you get the right people on the bus. Um, I'll talk, come back and talk about winning, uh, but again, the key consistent values that I've talked about. 
foster a strong coach athlete relationship. We've got to do that. This is done very differently. Um, one of the studies we did with American football, one coach that connected with kids looked like a sculpture piece from, you know, Greece. You know, really tall guy, chiseled, obviously not my build. But, I mean, he looked like, you know, like the statue. And the boys, these were 15-year-old boys, just looked up to him because he was commanding. He was very well connected. Another coach was a little skinny guy, tiny, that lived out in a rural community. But the kids would tell us that he was there 24-7 for you. He was always available. So what that taught me, coaches connect with kids in very different ways, depending on their personality and other things. But they connect. If we can coordinate the life skill efforts with other people in the kids' lives, parents, schools, religious organizations, you have a bigger effect. You're loading the dice. Uh, when I was in Singapore, we were doing some work about how sport and physical education can teach life skills. But then I went into the schools, and they had all the same life skills emphasized in the hallway. All the teachers were doing it. So you're going to have a bigger effect. Again, the emphasis on the part of reflection, I don't think we do this enough with kids. Well, think about that. How are you going to deal with that? You know, what do, what do kids tell you? I don't know. Well, I don't know. I mean, I remember working with a kid one on one. I said, OK, well, why don't you go to sit in there for 20 minutes and think about it, and I'll come back. And, you know, that's even a kiss of death for a kid, sit and just without their phone. But it was, you got to reflect and think about these things. And the other is sort of discuss them. Uh, we had some, again, this is instrumental, but also a life skill. We used to take uh, figure skaters to national championships, young skaters. And we'd have a session with the senior skaters, and we'd identify what unexpected events came up and how did you handle them. And we'd kind of model it and talk about it and have discussions. And a lot of the younger skaters said, yes, yeah, some stuff came up, but I remember we talked about it. I panicked, but then I remember we talked about it and I dealt with it. Teach for transfer. Um, when we do goal setting sometimes with kids in sport, we'll have them set goals for you know, whatever their sport is. Um, athletics, and they set their goals, time, and process goals. And then I have them set one goal for off the field. I want to be nicer to my sister at home. <laughs> whatever it might be, get them to think about something. And then when we have our Goal setting meeting, this again, I've done goal setting with coaches for a long time. It fails more often than not because the coach gets excited about it at the front of the season and never monitors it the whole season. You got to follow through, but if you're meeting with the kids every couple weeks, you go back and ask them about the non sport goal as well as the sport goal. And finally, we want to assess the, the, the survey. Now, most coaches I know aren't, you're not researchers. You know, but you can do some things like, I, I think one of the biggest things in a program is to do exit interviews. When kids age out of your program, what did you learn? What, was, what things really connected? Or when, if, if, if they're around and they come back, and really try to get a, a beat on what's really going on. What are they really picking up from what we do on this, on this stuff? Um, a couple future directions that I'll finish, because I think I'm just about out of my time. I still think we need to know how and why these life skills sort of stick in kids. We know there's big individual differences. Some kids really buy in, and other kids it's a lot more difficult. And we need explanations for what's occurring. I mentioned that wrestling study. The coach didn't identify this, but from observing him for a month, he had this process where he'd work on different skills across time, and he kept always talking to the boys about the individual understands that behavior has consequences. Oh, you're late. Well, you lose some points for this award system they had. And he goes, and the kid would say, but something happened. He goes, the butts aren't there. You're responsible for your behavior. You know, so that was sort of the old army guy in him. But he did it in a way that wasn't controlling, but he, he got the kids to think about that. And then he says, you have to take responsibility for your behavior. That's not my job then you're going to make choices. So what was interesting about him, he said, most people quit in their life. Not, the 10% of people who are successful are the ones that persist. So it's like you're blind going along a wall looking for a door and you can't find it. Most people are going to quit. 
And at the same time, he's doing these real hard physical conditioning with kids. And he kept talking about, you gotta make a choice. You gotta make a choice. And he, and he emphasized that to make the choice to continue. And then the individual starts to produce some change based on those choices. And then it forms a habit. And then the habit leads to positive consequences. So he's constantly talking about this because it's almost like a transformational process of how they work through things and how they work towards the things. We need more studies to learn about that. The other thing, what are the limits of sport? I love sport. My whole life's been developed a sport. Some of the positive youth development people only view sport as a vehicle. I go, you got to understand, for a volleyball coach or a basketball coach or a tennis coach, a good shot is a beautiful thing in and of itself and it's worthy of being in the world. <laughs> it's not just about what the kid gets from sport, it's sort of a combination of those. But is sport too adult dominated to teach life skills? In other words, if I let the kids work on their leadership, we may not win all the games. <laughs> Am I willing to live with that? Does the nature of sport influence what life skills? I was a wrestler, if you don't work hard in wrestling, you get beat up. I mean, it's just the nature of the beast. You're just, somebody's on top of you the whole time. In golf, you learn, you know, you, you, what are you hitting for two minutes and thinking about it for th three or four hours? You better learn some patience. Tennis, maybe is independent. So if we think about different sports, what are certain sports conducive to certain kind of lessons we might get? And the last is the role of winning, which is sort of a double-edged sword. As I mentioned, and I think Chris will talk about this more today, the more there's like a self-improvement focus that's correlated with a lot of things. At the same time, when we studied these NFL coaches that were not in the NFL, but NFL players nominated them for changing their lives, they won on average almost 80% of the games over a 30-year career and yet they were known for like changing people's lives. So they're not like they're opposite. And Martins many years ago talked about the dual role of winning. On one hand, if something doesn't count, like does a moral lesson of not cheating really teach you anything? Versus if it really counts and you do the right thing. So it's this double side and Flat and I did a study in Canada with university coaches and they recruited life skills. You know, they're looking at players. I mean, if you look in the drafts, the NBA and soccer, now they have, uh, you know, investigators go investigate the player. I'm going to pay you, you know, 7 million euros. I want to know that you don't get in trouble. <laughs> I want to know your background, those type of things. So how does winning kind of play in this? It doesn't have to be opposite, but it can't be the controlling thing. And I'm going to finish there because I think I've used all my time. Uh, and hopefully not too much, but I'll stop and, uh, and thank you. And I hope if you have questions, I'm around all day, so let me know.